The minute you're born and take your first breath is the moment you start to die. Life doesn't just start, it starts to end. And you begin the fight for your life. You see, you can only take so many breaths. Your heart can only beat so many times. The moment you're given life, you're condemned to die. And that's our shared human journey. A lifelong struggle for life that always ends in death. And I think you figured out why I'm, I'm a heart surgeon and not a motivational speaker. <laughs> You see, as a surgeon, I've seen so many ways that your body can fail you. So many ways that nature's invisible hands can just sneak up and grab you. So from my perspective, nature is a destructive force. Nature is trying to kill you. We're in a continual struggle against nature. And if you don't believe me, take a look at a picture of yourself from 10 years ago. We decay from the forces of nature. In fact, you're even programmed to die. Your DNA, the very blueprints of your life, at some point it'll just get snipped up, sent to the trash. Thanks for playing, game over. So for me, your health is a very special gift. We like to think it's our default setting, but it's not. You see, death is our default setting. Health should not be an expectation. You will not always be healthy. But the good news is we have innovative ways to fight back. When we fight against the forces of nature and when we push back death, even for a moment, I believe we've performed a small miracle. Today, I wanna to tell you about something that I believe is truly miraculous, heart surgery. I want to tell you about my adventures and my journey in the pursuit of mastery and some of the surprising lessons I learned along the way. While heart surgery as a profession, it's not very old. I mean, some people in this room may actually be younger than heart surgery. It was the final surgical frontier. Every other organ system had already been conquered. And if you can believe it, they used to actually say that anyone who even attempted to operate on the human heart would lose the esteem of his colleagues. It was forbidden. It was taboo. And there's a few reasons for this. One is probably practical. We just didn't have the tools we needed to operate on a beating heart. It'd be like trying to fix an engine while it's still running. But there's also something deeply mysterious, almost spiritual about a human heart. And even I think that, and I'm a surgeon. So here's an interesting question for you. How do you find your heart? If I ask any of you, you're gonna point here. You're gonna say, it's right here on my left. I put my hand over my heart when I sing the national anthem. But if you were to ask a heart surgeon the same question, how do you find your heart? Well, they'll tell you how. What they'll tell you is that the way I find your heart is I would take a saw and cut your breastbone right open and there's your heart right there. It's right in the very center at your core. It's a big difference in perspective, you see. A heart surgeon is very technical. They've been thinking so much about the how of heart surgery, it shapes how they think. So how do they actually do it? Well, once they find the heart, they'll sew some tubes in it and they'll drain blood out of your heart your heart, it will slowly deflate. It will become still and lifeless. They'll put their hands around your heart. They'll hold it. And to hold a human heart in your hands is the most incredible experience. Highly recommend it. <laughs> but don't marvel at it for too long because without a blood supply, it may never beat again if you don't move quickly. So heart surgery, it needs to be efficient. It needs to be delicate and it needs to be precise. It's also a creative endeavor. Many people don't understand this. It surprises people to find out sometimes that there's no textbook chapter that describes everything we do in heart surgery. It's not like fixing a car. There's no repair manual. It's just as much art as it is science. And every time I finish a surgery and I'm closing somebody's chest, I really do feel like I've been part of some kind of small miracle. It still amazes me the same way it did the first time I saw it. The first time I saw heart surgery, I was in medical school. I had this unique opportunity to go and watch a master heart surgeon at work. And the, the technical mastery I saw, I was completely transfixed. I went home that night and I decided that I wanted to be a heart surgeon. And I have no special talents, I'm an ordinary guy, but I figured that heart surgeons had to be made. They just weren't born that way. There had to be a process. There had to be a method for which you could learn such technical mastery. So I tried to find out how. Well, they say the toughest thing about heart surgery is not doing it, it's getting the chance to do it. And they're not wrong. There's only a handful of training programs and they'll accept one person per year, one. You have to be accepted by masters and become their apprentice. 
and you know it's called residency. What you may not have known is it's called residency because you need to be so dedicated and so immersed in the program that you're a resident of the hospital. You will train for eight to 10 years under a master. You may seek out different masters in different cities, even different countries. It's intense and it's exhausting. And it's a joy to watch this happen, this process. You know, if you watch a master surgeon performing with an expert team, it's like this beautiful coordinated dance. It's smooth and it flows. If you watch a trainee performing with the master, it's like two people having sex in a canoe. It's awkward. It's not enjoyable for anyone involved. We don't want to talk about it the next day. But with repeated practice, with time and experience, they start to improve and they start to develop this economy of motion, we call it. It's this efficiency that's purposeful. It's directed and targeted. And it's fun to watch this happen. I mean, it's a difficult process, but there's great joy in it. In fact, the masters themselves, they feel this obligation to train the novice and pass on the special skills that were so bestowed onto them. See one, do one, teach one. That's the mantra. It's a continual cycle. But the masters also teach by example, not just technical skills, but the vital personal skills you need for success. From my master teachers, I learned things like unwavering discipline, perseverance, and grit. And the most important, courage. The courage to act. Surgery is about making a courageous decision and acting on it. It's courageous action. And sometimes when I'm operating, I can still hear their voices in my head. You can be wrong, but never uncertain. You can't second guess when the scalpel's in your hands. Trust your training. And once you're finally trained, you go into practice. And we call it practice because we recognize it still takes many, many years of experience before you develop technical mastery. And some people don't understand, why does it take so long? Well, you see, in medical school, you just learn the language of medicine. You learn the words and what they mean. In residency, you start to use those words to write sentences. It's the first practical application. You may do parts of a procedure. Only once in practice, with experience, you take those words, you write sentences, and you actually start to write a story, something independent, something creative, unique. And one day, when I was in practice, many years in, I was actually forced to write a story. And in the process, I learned some really valuable and even surprising lessons about mastery. I'm gonna tell you about it. I was faced with a really complex case. Let's call him Tom. So Tom was a young man who was born with a defective heart valve and it got infected. There wasn't any time for second guessing as this infection was gonna destroy his entire heart if we didn't act quickly. So nature was knocking on Tom's front door. The principle of treating infection and surgery is you have to cut all the infected tissues out or it's just gonna come back. That's the easy part. The tricky part is you've now cut out a big hole in a very delicately and intricately designed organ, and you have to reconstruct it and make it functional again. Well, after I stopped Tom's heart and looked inside, indeed, the valve was completely destroyed. But worse, the infection had spread into all of the tissues around. The fibrous skeleton of his heart, the thing that holds all the moving parts all together and makes it one functional unit, had to be cut out and reconstructed. I was tempting nature like I had never had before. There was an operation I'd heard of, but never seen. I mean, it was so foreign and so out of this world, it was known between surgeons as the UFO procedure. People had done it. <laughs> People had seen them do it. But honestly, I don't think anyone could understand how they did it. It was just so technically complex. To do it, you have to take a piece of patch material. You have to bend and twist it into just the right size, shape, and orientation to bring all those pieces of a heart back together in one functional unit. It's like the Rubik's Cube of heart surgery. If you're off by even two or three millimeters anywhere, the heart's not gonna work properly. You could lose the patient. There was only one option for Tom, and it was the UFO procedure. But remember, see one, do one? Well, I'd never actually seen one. But with the help of a pretty amazing team, somehow I did the UFO procedure, this operation from another world, and I did it without really even knowing how to do it. It just happened. Tom walked out of the hospital with a strong beating heart. And I really believe, at least in that moment, I had a glimpse of this mysterious thing called mastery. And you see, there's something that's really fascinating that can happen when you start dancing with mastery. And I felt it when I operated on Tom. You can become intuitive and you can apply your skills to problems you've never seen before. You can conjure up some kind of unconscious competence. You stop tempting nature and you become a part of nature. Your actions become second nature. All the commitment, the endless repetition, the years of experience, it becomes hyper-focused, actualized in the moment. You can experience flow, this zone of peak performance. 
It's pure joy. It's like you've been on a long journey and you're finally home. But here's the surprising twist in the story. You see, something changed in me after I did that. The next time I picked up the scalpel, I had more doubt than ever before. I was confused. The mastery I experienced, it was kind of alien. It was fleeting. It was unpredictable, elusive. It kind of made me feel small. It made me aware there was so much I still didn't know, so much that maybe I would never know. It humbled me. Suddenly, I had more questions than answers. I'd been so focused on the how of things, I wasn't really asking why. And I think that sometimes the most important realities, they're right in front of you, and you just don't see them. Heart surgery wasn't about my personal journey toward mastery anymore. It wasn't how to do something so technical anymore. For the first time, I had sort of looked up. I looked past my magnified surgical lenses, past the surgical field. And for the first time, I could experience my patients in a different way. You see, in the pursuit of mastery, I'd only focused on a person's heart. And now I could better appreciate the heart of the person. After this taste of mastery, I wasn't operating on the person, I was operating for the person. And it wasn't that I had no compassion before, but my connection to my patients was through their technical problem, for which I had a technical solution. That's what I was trained to do. That's what all doctors are trained to do, technical mastery. But now my connection was deeper, it was more real. Something had shifted. I was giving a bit of my heart to them, the stakes seem so much higher. Let me see if I can explain. You see, surgery is unique because we have to hurt somebody to heal them. We have to stop somebody's heart, flatline the monitor, the very definition of death. I mean, you watch Grey's Anatomy, that character's not coming back, right? In surgery, we take you closer to death to give you life. We tempt nature momentarily so we can pull you back from its hands. And not everyone will survive a heart surgery. Even in the best hands, there are complications from the trauma of surgery. For every 100 heart surgeries I do, one or two patients will lose their lives in the fight. It's unavoidable. In the face of these risks, the trust that patients place in us, it's, ex it's exceptional. I mean, there's nothing like it. When I meet a patient for the first time before surgery, they look deep in my eyes and they try to figure out one thing. Do they trust me? And I mentioned the courage it takes to be a surgeon. Now imagine the courage it takes to be the patient. The courage they find and the trust they give in us makes heart surgery the greatest privilege, but at the same time, the greatest burden. Your heart has a strong will to keep going. I mean, it has heart. I could transplant your heart into somebody else, and it'll keep beating. It doesn't even need you to survive. But it's not perfect. It can fail. And surgeons are not perfect. We can fail. Perfection is impossible. But striving for perfection is deeply rooted in every surgeon. And I've come to understand that in the pursuit of mastery, you have to face your own imperfections. The small cemetery that you keep inside, it's a place where you go to search for an explanation for your failures. It's a difficult place to go. But you need to go there. You should go there. You just can't stay too long. Ever since my UFO close encounter with mastery, I think a lot about perfection and our commitment to our patients in return for the special trust they give us. It's been said that out of perfection, nothing can be made. And I've found great redemption and even comfort in this statement. Because you see, there's no change in perfection. There's no growth. There's no development. There's just no journey. Perfection is something beyond the human experience. And I've learned to embrace my imperfections. Before, I kind of had believed that mastery was about becoming and being perfect. And now I've come to understand that mastery is maybe just this realization that you'll never be perfect, but carrying on despite that fact. We surgeons, we try to perform a technically perfect surgery every time, but knowing we can't be perfect, we can be reassured by one thing. If we chase perfection, we catch excellence. Even though I'm not perfect and I can fail my patients, I can still offer them something even in failure. And this is just as important for healthcare providers to understand as it is patients. We can always offer hope. Hope that even if the technical wizardry fails us, you and I together, we can find something redeeming in the fight for life. That's the fight for the heart of the patient and not just their heart. That's compassion. You see, mastery is only about how we fight. Compassion is about why we fight at all. The heart of the patient is the reason for the fight. It's what's worth fighting for. And sometimes compassion even means not fighting at all, knowing when the fight is over. Sometimes not operating on someone is the most compassionate thing I can do. But of course, no surgeon will tell you about the surgery they didn't do. These are special situations. They require something beyond mastery. These situations require me to find my own heart, not just the heart of the patient. 
My grandfather was a master in his field. He was a bishop and a leader of the church, a master spiritual technician, if you will. He lived a simple life. He never exercised, but he seemed to always have good health. On his 90th birthday, he told me that heart can only beat so many times. And because of that, all of his athletic friends had died long before him. They had simply used up their heartbeats too quickly. <laughs> like you, I chuckled at this simplistic view of health. You know, he never preached outside the walls of the church, and he never preached directly to me. But on his 90th birthday, when I was still training, just starting my training in heart surgery, he gave me a gift on his birthday. He wrote down 33 words just for me. Not a very large field I plowed, but I never slept behind the plow. When I plowed, I plowed to the best, and using all my talents into others' hearts, I did invest. When I was a student of heart surgery, these words were just words. I mean, maybe I just didn't understand the words, like when I was in medical school. But years later, beyond mastery, I can see the humility, the selflessness, and the humanity in his message to me. And his message is this. To achieve mastery, you need to focus, so make your field small. To achieve mastery, you need unwavering discipline, perseverance, grit. You can never sleep. To achieve mastery, you need to be your best, so chase perfection. But once mastery is achieved, you need to be selfless and with great humility, apply the skills that have been invested in you for the benefit of all the people around you. So you see, my grandfather, a master himself, told me how to find my heart in just 33 words. So I ask you again, how do you find your heart? Is it here? Is it here? Or is it out there? Thank you. <laughs>